Next, the Waco investigation. A House Joint Subcommittee hearing on the fifth day of testimony on events at the Branch Davidian compound two years ago. Today's witnesses include officials of the Texas Rangers and lawyers for David Koresh. Joint Oversight Committee uh, on Waco will now come to order. Today will be a very interesting day, a long day. We have uh, panels that will take us, uh, I believe, late into the evening. We're hopeful that we can move forward. Um, and I'm, we're, I talked with uh, my colleague, uh, Bill McCollum, and uh, rather than uh, duplicate uh, some of the material, he's going to talk in his opening statement about what we've learned so far, and I'll just quickly talk about uh, where we're going. Um, from my point of view, as we reach this uh, halfway point, we've been very committed to get to the truth, to bring out uh, all the facts as to exactly what happened at Waco. Um, we got off to a, a tough start in the beginning, but I think that we are really dealing with substance. And uh, again, we, we learned uh, some major things. Uh, and, and again, Bill will get into these in detail, but uh, in, in Mr. Rodriguez's testimony yesterday, uh, I think our hearts went out to him as he explained in great detail how he tried to warn people that uh, the Davidians had been tipped off. Uh, we'll hear more about that today. Uh, we also learned that, that uh, there, David Koresh offered to have people come in and, and see the weapons. And uh, again, uh, these are the things that, that we really wanted to get to the bottom of. We now move into phase two. All the facts just mentioned, um, except that, and, and we'll, we'll get into uh, basically what happened during the 51 days that followed. On March 1st, 1993, the FBI took control. ATF was relieved of command, and the FBI and the Texas Rangers began what was come to be known now as the Waco Siege. The FBI-controlled siege ended with CS gas and a fire that burns in many hearts and minds. That fire, which followed insertion of CS gas into the compound, led to 22 children and more than 60 men and women burning alive. In just 15 minutes, the people who had been on the other end of the telephone were dead. This week, we asked the Justice Department to answer tough questions about their role. What happened that caused this second tragedy? Who made the key decisions? Why were they made? And on what information? And how can we prevent anything like this ever from happening again? We will hear from scholars, lawyers, and eventually Janet Reno herself. Did the FBI's negotiators give up? Did internal tension at the FBI develop between the tactical people and the negotiators? Were offers of surrender made and rejected? Could the Texas Rangers have ended the siege or assisted in that end if given a chance? Was the crime scene evidence destroyed or tampered with in any way? Any Waco documents? What were the roles of Mr. Potts, Mr. Hubble, the Attorney General, and the President of the United States? Did the President approve the use of CS gas? Did Attorney General approve the use of CS gas? Who accelerated the use of CS gas? Why was it used? in such great volume, and could that fire have been prevented? Still, as ATF Director McGraw said yesterday, and I just think that after sitting here all day and about six hours listening to he and Ron Noble, I can't help but feel good about his comments as he said that constitutional oversight hearings are good for law enforcement everywhere in this country. They are good for law enforcement on the local, state, and federal levels for one simple reason. They remind us all of the need for good plans, good procedures, and good responsible practices. Director McGaugh, I believe that you hit the nail on the head with that statement. 
I would also like to say that every single one of us is committed to not only finding out what happened to those four brave ATF agents, but also the men and women and children that also perished. We have a great respect for law and order. And I think anybody that makes any comments anywhere, anytime, that goes against that is irresponsible. Our commitment is getting at the truth. We have an oversight responsible role, and that's exactly what we intend to do. I'd now like to uh, yield to Mrs. Thurman from Florida for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we begin the next phase of our hearing. During the past four days, we heard about the role of ATF and the Department of Treasury in the planning of the faithful raid outside Waco on February 28, 1993. Four ATF agents were killed, 20 were wounded, and up to five branch civilians were also killed on that day. Yesterday, we listened to heart-wrenching testimony from Robert Rodriguez as he described his experiences inside the compound and his efforts to warn his superiors that Koresh knew agents would be coming. Robert watched helplessly from the perimeter while his fellow officers were cut down by automatic weapons fire. We were all touched by Mr. Rodriguez's account. Yesterday, we also heard from agents Belceros and Williams, the men who attempted to serve the warrant to David Koresh. Mr. Williams and Mr. Belceros and every single other witness who was in Waco that day agreed that the Davidians opened fire first. This is an important fact that is now established in the hearing record. It was, has also been firmly established that serious errors in judgment were made by ATF and other Treasury officials. As I stated yesterday in my opening statement, these mistakes are clearly outlined in the Blue Book. Once again, I have heard nothing up to this point that leads me to believe that there was any attempt to whitewash or cover up the facts in this case. Mr. Chairman, yesterday we also took testimony from Secretary for Law Enforcement Ron Noble and ATF Director John McCaw. I was encouraged to hear from both these gentlemen of the sweeping changes that were made in both the agencies. Secretary Noble stated that he issued a directive in August of 1993 that requires the Treasury Office of Enforcement to be notified of any significant operational manners that included the, business, the department's bureaus. In addition, Secretary Noble outlined the steps he had taken to improve general oversight within the department. Director McGaw also talked about changes made at ATF. Among the changes are increased in accurate intelligence, crisis management training for all ATF staff, and finally, a new ATF order that outlines undercover guidelines. I was encouraged by the statements of both Secretary Noble and De Director McGaugh in response to my question about Americans' constitutional rights. Both men said it was important for every one of their employees, from management to field agents, to be acutely aware of citizens' rights under our Constitution. Today we start our inquiry into the role of the FBI and the Department of Justice in the 51-day standoff that followed the February 28th raid. We will specifically be looking into the negotiations and the role of the FBI. We will undoubtedly hear testimony from some of today's witnesses that the FBI did not fully pursue negotiations. However, I believe that the testimony of Ms. Jewell, Joyce Sparks, and Robert Rodriguez all established clearly that Koresh was never going to leave the compound. In order to fulfill his prophecy, Koresh needed to create his own Amagadden. By surrendering, he would have been proven a false prophet to his followers. This fact is also now firmly established in the hearing record and I hope will be further examined during today's testimony. Another important point is that after the death and wounding of both ATF agents and Branch Davidians, a slow and careful process was employed by the FBI to negotiate a peaceful end to the gun battle. Let us not forget that the FBI maintained its channels to Koresh for 51 days. Some will say that Koresh constantly lied and kept looking for opportunities to spread his views. As we will hear, David Koresh always had another reason not to surrender, another condition, another demand, another chance to manipulate. After nearly two months of this posturing, it became apparent that Koresh was not leaving the compound under his own accord. There was no evidence that he would have relinquished the national spotlight, which he exploited for 51 long days. He would have continued to evade the real issue. He had answered a warrant with gunfire that killed four law enforcement officers. In closing, Mr. Chairman, let me state again as we enter this phase of the hearing that, I, that all I seek is the fact to make sure an event like this never happens again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mrs. Thurman. The chair recognizes and introduces the uh, co-chairman of the Joint Subcommittees and chairman of the Judiciary Committee's Crime Subcommittee, our good friend Bill McCollum from Florida. Well, thank you, Mr. Zeloff. I appreciate that introduction and our 
fifth day as we began today to look for the first time at the federal bureau of investigations role in this process and what happened on the fatal last day after fifty one days of siege i think it's appropriate for us to very briefly look back on what we've just witnessed and particularly what we heard yesterday because yesterday was a very fruitful hearing as far as i was concerned in fact both sets of them were in trying to put in perspective what had happened on february twenty eighth and why it happened first of all i think there were two very significant points that were discovered yesterday which i certainly had not been aware of and i don't believe were in anybody's report or investigation in the kind of decisive manner we learned them yesterday one of those is that the atf had did not have the capability uh, to conduct a siege they didn't have the experience or the negotiators to actually do that in the discussions yesterday evening with mr noble we learned that we had documentation of that and we found out that for, for a fact and that was a factor a very serious and significant factor leading to the decision ultimately to do the dynamic entry that led to the tragic deaths that we know about on the twenty eighth of february the second thing that i think we learned uh, yesterday that was very important and we've been building up to it with a lot of questions uh, on days before but really hadn't quite gotten to the point of getting the admissions that came out yesterday was that the atf actually abandoned the idea of trying to arrest david koresh outside the compound some ten days or two weeks or maybe longer before the february twenty eighth raid in other words they weren't looking to try to cut him off or cut the head of the snake off as somebody said uh... and try then to do whatever they needed to do to go in and search the compound they had completely abandoned that idea now those two things are important for a few reasons and i want to outline them and in doing that i'd like to make the observation at least it's my observation that if this is a case where there's plenty of blame to go around there's not one single thing that caused the problems that occurred on the day of this raid on february twenty eighth there was a lot of emotion out here yesterday a lot of finger pointing understandably a lot of conscience being brought forward but let's run through a few of those things first of all clearly if this element of surprise or the point of secrecy had not been lost uh, this raid might have been successful the agents all expressed that so the loss of secrecy the loss of surprise certainly contributed to the failure of the raid on the twenty eighth the but for concept is there but for the loss of surprise there might not have been the tragedy that there was but in addition to that we can say that but for the fact that uh, the raid planners this came out yesterday not having heard about or listened to joyce sparks or anyone else with the expertise on the religious nature and the real true meaning of what david koresh was trying to say but for the failure to listen to their warnings about not going in directly as they did and instead trying to arrest him outside the compound uh, maybe this would not have happened in addition in addition one can say uh, but for the fact that david koresh was not arrested and that uh, but for the fact that they at the atf abandoned the idea of arresting him outside the compound uh, and separating him from those inside this tragedy might not have happened another but for uh, it comes with a question of the press involvement i don't think there was any stronger word yesterday than mr hartnett condemning the cameraman and the press for getting involved as aggressively they, as they did in blowing the cover i don't know to what degree atf's involvement with the newspaper uh... and some of the other activities about the press led to this hype or led to the fact that cameron was on the road but obviously the press was overly aggressive and obviously the cameraman blew the cover of this raid to the postman who went in and was a member of the Davidians and told Koresh about the folks who were coming that morning. So one can say, but for the cameraman and but for the overzealous press, this tragedy might not have occurred. And then one has to ask himself, despite Mr. Nobles uh, trying to find a way to excuse it last night, uh, if Secretary Benson, when he first took over as Secretary of the Treasury, had done what one would normally expect a secretary to do in the first thirty days he's in office and that's meet with the heads of his law enforcement agencies such as the atf uh, if secretary benson had just met with mister higgins and had an ordinary conversation in which he asked him what are the significant items on your plate right now which i suspect he would have asked well maybe just maybe then the facts would have come out earlier about the fact that this waco raid was going to take place or something was going to happen down there and the treasury department would have investigated it uh, and a much more thorough manner instead of learning about it 48 hours before and maybe this entire tragedy would not have happened then we have the report the treasury report i would suggest that we learned that it is a reasonably good report or it was a reasonably good report but it was not the terrific all perfect report that some would like to have you believe we learned a lot of new information 
and we did play some of the things in the record that yesterday that clearly were not in that report what bothered me the most about all of that though was the fact that it appears that mr noble and some others down at treasury did attempt to distance themselves from the events of waco to try to quickly assess the blame and place it on the a t f agents on the line and make them the fall guys and yes there was some blame there to be placed and there's nothing necessarily wrong with the placing of the blame but the matter in which it was done and the callousness with which it was done seems to me to be somewhat striking at times and one of the ways that i want to point that out is to just point out this element of surprise question after i questioned mr noble yesterday extensively and listening to all the other witnesses leading up to this question about what was all it all about it was very clear and he admitted it that at no time to the treasury department direct anybody at the a t f to abandon the raid if the element of surprise was lost now they did think they had assurances that this raid would not take place if everything didn't go right and mr higgins was confident that it wouldn't have occurred had the agents in the field done what normally you would expect them to do and not go forward if surprise was lost and they learned about it but nonetheless mr noble went ahead and did things that were not only in the report suggestive of the fact that treasury directed this to happen and it didn't happen and therefore this was the real problem in this raid but also on sixty minutes on may fourteenth nineteen ninety five he said and i quote what was absolutely clear in washington at treasury and in washington at a t f was that no raid should proceed once the element of surprise was lost then the raid planners would have said okay we can't go forward with the raid that's what should have happened that's what the raid planners were trained to do that's what they were directed to do and they didn't do it now that simply wasn't so and mr noble stretched that point i wouldn't say trying to tell a lie about it but i would say it was all part of the mental attitude down at treasury at that point to distance themselves and make sure they didn't take any of the blame for this they were new in office they attempted very hard to put distance between themselves and those who were at fault that's what i got out of yesterday's hearings mr chairman i think we now need to put that aside we'll come back to it in our final report of the of the committee at the end after we finished all of this work and we are today as you've indicated going to proceed to focus on the second half of this the fifty one day siege and what happened that led up to the final tragedy at waco in april thank you thank you mr mccall thank you mr mccollum chair now recognizes the ranking minority member of the crime subcommittee chuck schumer from new york thank you mr zelop and uh... first let me say i thought yesterday's hearing represented both the best and the worst of what could be and what could come out of these types of hearings the best was, I think, hearing Mr. Rodriguez tell what happened and hearing the rebuttal from the other witnesses. It came out clearly. There was a dispute as to what happened, but everyone could make their own judgment. And I think that that is very, very important because, as I said at uh, yesterday morning's opening statement, losing the element of surprise and then going ahead with the raid was the greatest, greatest mistake that, had, that occurred in the whole Waco tragedy. The worst is sort of idle throwing out of words with very little proof. The word cover-up yesterday. Cover-up's a serious word. It implies a crime. And Mr. Hartnett threw it out. A few members of, the, a few, a few members of this committee latched onto it. But there was not a single bit of proof of cover-up. And that is the kind of thing, in my judgment, that poisons these hearings. Getting at the truth? Great. We should even if the truth has already come out. But just throwing around words that really have no basis in fact and that are very serious words, that is a danger of this hearing. It's been a danger throughout. We in the minority have tried to limit that danger, and I hope it will be continued. In this regard, I do want to praise my colleague, Mr. McCollum, who last night, most of you were gone, said that he agreed that there was no real proof of cover-up, and in fact, even today in the Washington Times, um, hardly a fan of the government's position, they said that the hearing produced, quote, no proof that Wojnowski and Sarabin's reinstatement was inspired by a cover-up. So I think all of us have a responsibility to make sure that when we throw around these words that there be some backing for the very reason that there are a few in the extreme of America who want to believe the worst and saying things to them uh, in a national audience that are not backed up play into what I would consider paranoid fears. 
Um, finally, I would say that, again, yesterday's hearing was dramatic. It served a purpose. But let's not, let's not uh, uh, forget and let's not get away from the fact all the major facts, Mr. Rodriguez's testimony, Mr. Sarabin and Mr. Hoynotsky's response were already in the public record. I stand by my statement that nothing very materially new came out, even the thing mentioned by Mr. McCollum that uh, ATF gave up on the idea of serving Koresh. He's right, but it was criticized. ATF was criticized in the very report for that, in the blue book, which I think is a, it's not a 100% accurate document, but it's a darn good job. Next point I would like to make is about Tuesday morning quarterbacking, and this relates to the next phase of the hearing. It's going to be very easy for every one of us in hindsight to say this was done wrong, that was done wrong. And today, for instance, we're going to hear from a lot of Tuesday morning quarterbacks. We're going to hear from critics, volunteers, amateurs who've had no experience in negotiating with a heavily armed cult. We're going to hear from those who bore, no, bore uh, no responsibility then or now for ever taking action. And even we're going to hear from some who have conflicts of interest, lawyers and lawsuits who benefit from positions against the government. And we ought to be careful. Just remember this, ladies and gentlemen. We were dealing with someone who had an apocalyptic vision. Take the hypothetical that Janet Reno waited more than the 51 days. And on day 57, Koresh, through some maddening view of his own, set fire to the compound while the FBI agents had still surrounded it. Guess what would be happening? Everyone would be criticizing Janet Reno for being indecisive and for not taking action. Monday morning or Tuesday morning or any morning quarterbacking is easy, but we must remember that we had what, what, that it is difficult to do, and furthermore, that we had an armed group of people led by someone who was a child molester, led by someone who violated, violated laws. Another argument that will come up today is about limits to tolerance. Well, we're going to hear a lot of academic lectures on how we should be tolerant of new religious sects. I firmly believe in that. I believe in faith. I respect faith. I have faith myself. I was the author of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which expanded the bounds of what religions could permissibly do against, uh, in, in America, no matter what the government said. In fact, myself and Chris Cox uh, joined in that uh, uh, crusade with Senator Kennedy or Orrin Hatch and passed the law last year. But folks, there are limits to tolerance. Sexual perversion, the rape of small children, the hoarding of large amounts of weapons is not excused by any religion and by any Bible. Finally, um, let's keep up doing something. I've detected a change in the tone of these hearings from my friends on the majority side. The first few days, there was much more bashing of law enforcement than there is today. I believe, nervous, let the record show nervous and defensive laughter. Uh, <laughs> Not in your wildest dreams. Okay. Not in your wildest dreams. In any case, much. in any case, let us keep remembering let us keep remembering the brave men and women of law enforcement who were under significant, significant strain and stress. They are not our enemies. The ATF was not our enemy. The FBI is not our enemy. If they made mistakes, let's correct them. But let us not weaken them. Let us not bash them. Let us not pick apart every single little immaterial decision that they made in an effort to bring those proud and brave agencies down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, may I make the announcement that was uh, yes, If I might, uh, I'd like to ask you now to send that the interview transcript of uh, Ron Nobles of CBS on 60 Minutes, May 14, 1995, be entered in the record. Without objection, so ordered. We have today a uh, special opportunity to uh, hear some new additional information um, and I'd like to just introduce the uh, biographies of the panel. Dick Guerin is a widely recognized defense attorney in the state of Texas. 
He represented David Koresh and entered the compound during the siege. I uh, would like to also introduce Mr. Jack Zimmerman, also a well-known and respected attorney. Happens to be a new grandfather within the last few hours. Um, we appreciate your being here. You represented Steve Snyder. He also gathered firsthand evidence upon entering the compound during the siege. In addition to being a defense attorney, Mr. Zimmerman is a colonel in the United States Marine Corps Reserve. He practices as a military judge. Two very credible witnesses, welcome. If you uh, would please stand, take the oath. Raise your right hand. Do you swear and solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give these subcommittees is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please be seated. Let the record show that uh, both answers were the affirmative. Yes. And um, I'd simply like to greet uh, these two very fine attorneys and fine constituents and appreciate their public service as well. I know both gentlemen, Mr. Guerin and Mr. Zimmerman, who have given of their time to the less fortunate, uh, who have been uh, stellar members of the Texas Bar Association and uh, additional uh, bar associations throughout the nation. And I'm just very proud to have them here and to have them as Americans, to have them as Texans, and to have them as Houstonians. And I welcome you. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much, Mr. Jackson Chairman. Lee. Appreciate that. I also note that their families are sitting behind them, and we welcome all of you. The uh, first question, the chair would like to recognize the chairman of the full committee on government oversight, Mr. Bill Klinger from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I yield to the gentleman from Maryland, I would just note that the gentleman from New York indicated that he sensed a change of tone on this side of the aisle, might I say that I have recognized a similar change of tone on the other side of the aisle. I do recall at the beginning of these hearings, uh, the gentleman from New York indicated that he thought that the, uh, there was no purpose to these hearings, that they were redundant, perhaps politically motivated. I was pleased to hear him say this morning he feels that a useful purpose is being served by these hearings, which I totally agree with. At this point, I would then like to yield the rest of my time to the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Mr. Ehrlich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome to Washington. Thank you. Thank you. In more ways than one, right? Uh, Mr. Zimmerman, uh, by way of introduction, I have a question for you, but by way of introduction, Sitting here for the first four days, and particularly with respect to yesterday's testimony, I am uh, fairly satisfied that a lot of the procedures, a lot of the personnel, a lot of the mindset that uh, ATF had prior to Waco is no longer in place. And, and that's been a very positive aspect of these hearings. To me, one of the most uh, disturbing uh, findings or pieces of evidence that we've we've uncovered so far was a series of memos that Mr. Barr uh, brought forth, I believe, last Friday. Now, sir, you certainly are not an amateur when it comes to criminal law, are you? No, sir. In fact, you are a professor of law? I am uh, board certified uh, in criminal law by the state and national boards. And, sir, uh, you are also, I believe, a, a uh, reserve Marine colonel? I just retired, yes, sir, as a colonel in the Marine Corps Reserve. And you have sat as a military judge, sir? That's correct. That was my last assignment. Sir, uh, are you familiar with the material that was produced last Friday with respect to a series of memos emanating from the Department of Justice to Treasury, uh, the, the topic of which, generalizing, was a directive to Treasury to cease investigation into various aspects of the Waco incident because Brady-type material had or could be produced. Are you familiar with those memos, sir? Generally, yes, sir. Now, sir, and I think Mr. Noble's testimony yesterday was quite illuminating because we're not talking about the shooting investigation that ATF had conducted. We're talking about directives simply from Justice to Treasury. And, sir, my question to you is, uh, and this goes far beyond these hearings, in my view. Do you have a professional opinion, sir, with respect to the appropriateness of those memos and those directives? Yes, sir, I do. Could you please provide this committee and the American public with your opinion? As I understood the rationale. Yes, sir. Closer to you. Yes, sir. How's that? Great. Great. If there's a specific part of any particular memo, it might make more sense if I would have it in front of me. But in general, as I understood what happened, 
was uh, the rationale given for those directives was to were to prevent simultaneous investigations. Correct, uh, sir. I, I think that's what it was. That's been the testimony. Uh, in general, uh, if an investigation were going forward and being done correctly, it probably would not be necessary to do two, and one might get in the way of the other. But that's not what I understood the purpose stated in the memos was. As I understood, it said that the memos were revealing that the evidence was not hanging together and not fitting together, and that it was creating Brady material that would have to be turned over to the defense. And now, sir, the, the, uh, the phrase Brady material has been thrown around these hearings. Would you please give a definition that the American public can understand? Yes, sir. There is, the Supreme Court of the United States has established a constitutional rule that if there is evidence that would either go to uh, exculpate or show the innocence of an accused person or would lessen the punishment if convicted and the prosecution has that evidence, that must be provided to the defense so that the fact finder, the jury or the judge would be aware of it. So, sir, in reality, it creates an affirmative duty on the part of the government to, to produce exculpatory material, is that correct? That's correct, both in state and federal prosecutions. And my understanding was, from those memos, is that the concern was not that there not be two simultaneous investigations that might be stepping on each other uh, and going in different directions, but instead, the purpose of stopping the second investigation, if you will, was because it was producing conflicting exculpatory type material that under the rules would have to be turned over to the defense. And sir, is it your testimony that such memos directly contradict the law that, that Brady dictates? If, if as a result of those memos, exculpatory evidence was not turned over to the defense, I think that uh, whoever was on trial in, the, in that particular case, this or some other case, would probably, if that could be proven to have been material evidence that would have affected the, the outcome of the trial, would probably result in new trials for the people who were wrongly co convicted. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman. Mr. Zimmerman, also, uh, let me direct you to the events surrounding the incident. I know you certainly know you have a lot of information. Uh, could you describe the 911 calls that took place? And, and do you have an opinion, sir? as to uh, why it took so long to secure a ceasefire? Let me tell you what I know about the 911 first and then move to the second one if that's all right. When Dick DeGarren and I were in on April the 1st and conducted a fact investigation so that we could give legal advice to our clients, Wayne Martin told us that he had called 911 as soon as the shooting started. And I remember distinctly interrupting him and, because he was a civil lawyer, a Harvard Law School graduate. And I said, Wayne, don't lie to us because 911 calls are recorded. And when we get out of here, we're going to go get those 911 calls. And if your voice isn't on, isn't on them, then we're going to doubt whatever else you tell us. So we were aware on April the 1st that, that, was that there was a 911 call. And they said it reflected uh, what had been passed on by the postman. That is that 75 armed men were going to be making an attack. And, and you know there weren't 75 men, as it turned out, but I think it's significant. When the 911 tapes were released, there's Wayne Martin using that exact figure. There are 75 armed men here. They're shooting. We have women and children. Call them. Tell them to stop it, to hold off. Uh, when we were in, we were also told that the firing started from the outside and that they had been fired on by helicopters. If you listen to the 911 tapes that were eventually released, you hear my client, Steve Schneider, in the background in some other part of the room. Maybe he didn't even know that the, that the telephone call was being made. And he's saying, here come the helicopters. Well, here come the choppers with people on them. Uh, they're firing again. Uh, so that's recorded. And uh, so the significance of those tapes, and I think I'm to your second part of your question, to me and to Dick was that we were being told the truth by the people on the inside by independent evidence that has nothing to do with the credibility of our clients. That is a recorded telephone call. Mr. Wise from West Virginia, five minutes. Gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Collins. I thank the gentleman for yielding. 
Uh, before I begin my questions, let me make an observation. The 51-day standoff at the Davidian compound was, according to the Department of Justice, unprecedented in the annuals of American law enforcement. Over the 51-day period, there were 25 trained FBI negotiators maintaining daily contact with people in the compound. They consulted with a vast range of religious, medical, and scientific experts. Those critics who will argue that the FBI should have waited even longer have a big burden. Koresh was a known liar and a child sex molester. The physical conditions of the compound were deteriorating every day. No one left the compound before March 23rd, almost a month before uh, the insertion of the CS gas. While we will never know for sure whether an appeal to Koresh on the basis of religious dogma would have resulted in his uh, surrender, there are some things about his religion that we do know. We do know that Koresh used his religion to justify sexually molesting young children. We do know that Koresh used his religion to terrify children. We do know that Koresh used his religion to separate children from their parents. We do know that Koresh used his religion to murder ATF agents. Finally, the words of young Kerry Jewell continue to ring in my ears. Koresh, she said, was not coming out. He wanted to die. Under these circumstances, it's difficult to believe that any other outcome was possible. And so, Mr. DeGuerin, uh, I'll ask you, did you hear the testimony of 14-year-old Carrie Jewell who testified that she was sexually molested by Koresh when she was only 10 years old? Yes, ma'am, but I didn't come here to defend uh, David Koresh, uh, and, and I don't intend to. What I did come here for is to give my knowledge to this panel about And you did come here to I answer saw. my questions. And so my next question is, was Koresh concerned about the public's perception of him as a child molester? Yes, he was. Isn't it true that child molesters don't live long in prison? If I see the, uh, what uh, you're leading to. Uh, no, yes, I'm he just was asking afraid you a question. Jail. I don't think you can read my mind. You can just answer my question. Uh, there, there's, there are efforts made to uh, segregate child molesters in jail from the rest of the population, and when they're not segregated, they're in danger of being killed. Well, did he ever talk about his chances of surviving in prison as a known child molester? Yes, he did, and I uh, covered that subject with Sheriff Harwell and was assured that uh, he would be segregated uh, in the jail. So then he did have some major concerns. Well, after you became his attorney, did any of the children, women, or any other Davidian uh, come out of the compound? I'm sorry? After you became his attorney, did any of the children or the women or any other Davidian come out of the compound? No, ma'am. Why would you say that was? Because they, it was their home. They didn't want to leave their home. They didn't know why they had to leave their home. Uh, they, they were a religious community that were, were very proud of their home. They built it by hand. They didn't want to leave. How long were you uh, his attorney? Well, from uh, March the 9th until April the 19th. So that's roughly four weeks? Well, it's a little longer than that. A little longer than yes. four weeks. Uh, did you do it on a pro bono basis, or were you going to charge some kind of fee? Well, it turned out to be pro bono. I was hoping to be paid, and I uh, thought I probably would be, but it didn't turn out that way. In order to talk with Koresh, you went into federal court and filed a petition for a writ of habeas corpus. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And um, in our, uh, my understanding is that federal district judge Walter Smith, Jr. ruled that Koresh having been involved in the killings of four ATF agents ruled that cult members do not have legal rights to counsel while they remain holed up in a heavily armed compound. Is that correct? No, ma'am. Explain it to me. Uh, he, he ruled that uh, habeas corpus was not the proper method for establishing contact with Koresh. I believe he was wrong and uh, intended to appeal that ruling, but the FBI mooted my appeal by putting me in contact with him. So the FBI then allowed you not only to talk with him, but to meet with him after he and his followers had killed, already killed, four ATF uh, agents. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> had you ever been allowed to interview a client prior to his arrest for the murder of law enforcement agents after being turned down by a court? I've, I frequently have interviewed clients before they've been arrested and when they're either being sought by uh, the, the law with a warrant or before warrants been issued. That's a, it's a frequent practice of criminal lawyers to do so. 
So you spent a lot of hours with uh, Koresh, is that right? Yes, ma'am, I did. About 32 hours uh, in person and on the telephone. Now, is it true to say that he felt that ATF raid on the compound and the killing of four ATF agents was the fulfillment of his prophecy? No, not exactly. He thought that it w had been prophesized that uh, they would be attacked, and it was uh, a debate that we went into uh, quite uh, at length about what it all meant and what was next to happen. Uh, there was, I, I was receiving uh, advice from two religious experts about apocalyptic vision and the Bible. Uh, I wasn't very well, well versed in it myself. I'm just a Methodist. But uh, <laughs> I did learn a lot, both from David and from uh, uh, Dr. Tabor and Dr. Arnold, who are the next witnesses following me, about his view. His view was a flexible view. That is, he was able to, or, or his view of what was prophesied was not set in concrete. They didn't have to die, and he didn't see the end of this situation as necessarily being his death and the death of his followers. Well, that's Collins, your time has expired. Oh, shoot. I know, you're having, you're having, you're having a lot of fun. Uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Boyer from Indiana for five minutes. I just have uh, one uh, quick comment. Uh, that is, uh, I have to agree with my uh, good friend from uh, New York about all of us exercising the responsibility uh, of our words. And I think that's why, uh, I, my laughter is, that's why you see the change in tone coming out of Mr. Schumer, uh, is that uh, he does also, I believe exactly what he's saying, is that we have to be better, exercise better responsibility in our words. And that's why some of us are pretty upset with uh, the president's press secretary uh, uh, being pretty loose with the, uh, with the tongue and, and saying things that I'm sure he does not mean. And that's why you don't hear as much about the NRA. And I agree with Mr. Schumer's assessment a couple days ago that the water has dried up in that river. And uh, that's why you've seen the change in tone coming from the other side. And that's why I had to share my laughter when he accused us in the change of tone. So let me yield to my good friend, uh, Mr. Ehrlich, for the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman, just as a uh, short follow-up to your previous testimony, I've been able to locate the March 1, 1993 memorandum, wherein uh, it is noted, Mr. Barr went into this last Friday, as you know, and I'm quoting from the memorandum, Johnson at this point advised Hartnett to stop the ATF shooting review because ATF was creating Brady material. That's what you're referring to, correct, sir? Yes, sir. And, sir, your professional opinion as to the appropriateness on the one hand and on the other, the legality of such a policy is what, sir? Well, I think it's inappropriate any time a prosecutor in an ongoing case, and I'm assuming the Johnston you're talking about is the assistant United States attorney that planned or, or approved the dynamic entry search warrant and insisted on a dynamic entry and was very much involved in the case and then later prosecuted the survivors. Yes, sir. The same person? I, I think it, any prosecutor would say it's inappropriate to try to discourage Brady material being turned over. Now, I don't know from this whether Brady material ever existed. And so that's what probably Mr. Johnson would have an out on. If there were no Brady material um, and none, in fact, was withheld, then there might not be cause for a new trial. But if Brady material existed and it was not turned over, then somebody needs to have a hearing and establish for a court that Brady material was in fact suppressed. I don't know whether it was or wasn't from here. Thank you, sir. A question for, for both of you. And, and quite frankly, I had hoped not to get into this area because I have found the testimony with respect to the issue of who shot first quite compelling from the ATF agents who have testified in front of this joint panel. Now, because you've brought it up and because it is a legitimate issue in these hearings, let me ask an open-ended question to the both of you. What is your opinion on the basis of the evidence that you've seen with respect to the issue of who shot first?
part of what a lawyer does is to try to gather facts about the crime. And so much of what I did when I was inside was interview witnesses and look at evidence. And what I saw and what I was told was very compelling that the ATF fired first. Understanding that uh, those on the inside had a, a big stake in this and, and I might have been lied to. But what I saw confirmed that they fired, that the ATF fired first. Uh, everyone who was in a position to know from the inside told me that, that the firing came first from the outside. Some people said that it was the dogs that were being killed, and there were dogs killed. That is, it was part of the ATF plan to kill the pet dogs when serving this civilian search warrant. I was told that firing came from the helicopters, and Jack Zimmerman and I saw the bullet holes in the ceiling of the highest room in the compound. Uh, I saw the bullet holes in the front door. Now you, this panel, can, can get that evidence. What you need to find is the videotape that was made of the raid. It disappeared. What you need to get is the photographs of the front uh, that are similar to the one that's being displayed right now. This is a photograph that was taken with a long-range lens from the, the uh, surveillance house. There's bound to be more photographs. This is early in the raid, as you can see, and there are very few bullet holes in the front of the building. If you'll remove to the next uh, photograph, you'll see this is taken later, and there are many bullet holes that you can see in this photograph. These bullet holes... Uh, are, and you can see from the, from the news videotape how they're made. They're made by officers that are firing blindly, uh, just emptying their clips at the front of the building. Now, if you'll notice the door, I sat by that door for several hours. I went in and out of that door ten times, and I saw the bullet holes on the door on the right side. Almost every bullet hole was an incoming round, and... What I mean by that, it's a metal door. You could easily tell that the bullets were incoming rounds. They were punched in. Now, I'm not the, the marine expert that Jack Zimmerman is, but I've been hunting since I was 10 years old, and I know a bullet hole when I see it. And those were bullet holes that were punched in. Now, you have the power to get that evidence, and you ought to get it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I know my time's up, but I also asked my question to Mr. Zimmerman. I think it might be appropriate yeah. for him to complete the answer. You're correct. I agree with everything Dick said. We tried to corroborate, just like with the 911 tape, corroborating that didn't have anything to do with our clients telling us. A and I think some testimony you got yesterday from the ATF agent uh, that has been who, from New Orleans uh, was very telling. He said that it when they were getting out of the trucks, they were already drawing fire, and it was coming from almost every window on the second floor. Recall that? And he said it was uh, AK-47s and 50 caliber uh, machine guns were shooting at them. Well, if you'll put that first one back up there, when you go back and look at the evidence, that just doesn't hang together, okay? To use a phrase that I've already seen in one of your memos, that does not hang together because... Uh, there are no bullet holes up there in the second floor, and there's nobody up there shooting in the second floor. There's no windows open up there on the second floor. There's no guns out of the second floor. There's no AK-47s or 50 caliber machine guns. Yet the ATF have already dismounted and out there, and looks like they've already taken some casualties. Yet no one is in those upper windows. Nobody's in the lower windows. And let me tell you, if you think that the Branch Davidians had 48 automatic weapons and 50 caliber machine guns already arranged in a, quote, ambush position. And they see, you've got to visualize this, there's about a 500-yard driveway coming up to this place in a plane. I mean, uh, you can see it from a long way away. They had already been tipped off. If the Branch Davidians intended to ambush those people with 48 machine guns and 50 caliber machine guns, and they came up, in unprotected cattle cars with nothing but tarps on them, they would have blown them away. So that convinced us that they did not, that is, the Davidians did not fire first. Now, you asked about our personal opinion. 
My personal opinion is that it was an accidental discharge uh, by one of the ATF agents as he was dismounting, and that that was a signal to open fire, which you haven't heard any testimony about. Nobody asked him, what was the signal to open fire if you did open fire? Who made that decision? What command was it? But I believe that what the evidence from the uh, trial, the criminal trial was, is that somebody off to the side heard, a firing, heard somebody fire, and they testified that it came from behind them. So that's uh, why we believe, uh, for those reasons, that the uh, branch divisions did not fire first. And I will point out to you from talking to the foreman of the criminal trial jury, who had six weeks of testimony by the government and two days of testimony from the defense, they could not decide and told me, the foreman of the, of the jury told me they did not decide because the evidence was in such conflict as to who fired first. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. My point of order is this. Point of order. Yes, in terms of the structure of these hearings, yesterday we were focusing on what happened at the raid. If these witnesses had statements to make on who fired first, it's only fair to allow those who are in the line of fire, agents like Buford and Rodriguez, to have some rebuttal time. And yet oh. the way, the, <coughs> excuse me, except the way these hearings were structured, we, they're gone, they made their point, nobody controverted them, nobody brought up anything. Now we have some lawyers who were not on the scene saying they interviewed nameless people, I'm sure they can name them, and saying, oh no, it is not clear who fired first. That is not fair. That is not a proceeding that is right. If we want to go over the issue of who fired first, then yes. we should, wait a second, I'd like that's to finish my point. point. That's not a point of uh, order. It is a point of it order. It is not a point of we order. You are Mr. out of Zimmerman order. And you are Mr. out of order, Mr. Zimmerman and Mr. DeGaron on one side of the table and Buford and Rodriguez okay. on the other. I will just make one comment to the witnesses uh, relative to uh, the videotape in the front door. We have uh, consistently asked as a committee to get a copy of a videotape, which they now say is blank. We have asked for the door and the door is missing. Uh, I'll now move and chair recognize Mrs. Taylor from Mississippi for five minutes. Do you have any combat experience? Excuse me, sir? Do you have any combat experience? With 26 you? months, sir. Commanded two artillery batteries in Vietnam. In Vietnam? Yes, sir. Mr. Zimmerman, did you happen to hear the uh, testimony of a fellow Vietnam veteran, Mr. Buford, who had served with the Green Berets, who said that even as a Green Beret, he had been ambushed and he'd been on the losing side of ambushes, if I recall. He said he was never outgunned that in Vietnam the way he was against the Branch Davidians. Do you have any reason to doubt that? No, sir. I, I, I don't doubt his testimony. I, I don't know what ambushes he were in Vietnam. Okay. If he was Green Beret, he was Zimmerman, a small let, unit. Let me just ask you, and again, Mr. Uh, your colleague said, well, he's just a Methodist. I'm just a dumb Coast Guardsman, okay? <laughs> Thank goodness I've never been shot at. But I can look at what I have seen, you know, ambushes and... I would think if you're ambushed, you don't have the time to pick your shots. I just have a gut feeling that bullets are flying all over me, and, and there's one of me, that you don't really have time to pick your shot, that basically, that yes, you're going to empty your clip and hope you hit something, and you don't get hit in the meantime. That could be true, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, that could be true. So yes. that could very well explain the very bad pattern of shots around those windows, couldn't it? It could. I'd like to come back to that in a minute, though. I want to answer your question. It could. Okay. Let me take it a step further. And, and you, you talked about the 911 call, Mr. Zimmerman. And, and let me tell you this. If you were an ATF agent, I would be defending you the same way. And if you were a Marine being accused of, of being out of line, I'd probably be defending you the same way. But I do look at something when they say the helicopters are shooting at us. I mean, they've had plenty of time to alter the looks of things, didn't they, by the time you'd gotten there? We Hadn't came in a month said, later. <clears throat> we came in a month later, but we month. thought about that. And if I may, <clears throat> we asked the Texas Rangers because, and I've testified under oath at the criminal trial to this, I couldn't tell you whether those rounds were fired from a helicopter or not. All I could tell you is they came from the sky downward. If somebody were standing on top of the roof shooting down into the ceiling, it would look exactly the same way. Thank you very much. You've made my point, Mr. Zimmerman. And another point I want to make. Do you have any, I understand you're a Marine, and I thank you for your service to your country. Do you have any sons or daughters in the service now? I certainly do. My daughter is a captain of Marines. She's a prosecutor at El Toro Marine Corps Air Station. My son, who just had the baby last night at 5.15, actually his wife, 5.15, <laughs> is, uh, is a first lieutenant of Marines, and he's a uh, 
naval flight officer will be flying in the F-A-18 Delta jet. And congratulations to both thank of them, and thank both of them for their service. My point is that many people say, why did they come back with armored vehicles towards the end? I'm going to personalize this, Mr. Zimmerman. You're, you're General, you're at Commandant Mundy, and it's your two sons. And they've already been one firefight, and the good guys got outgunned. They just flat got outgunned. They were the ones, the good guys, the ones asking for a ceasefire, not the Davidians. It is the ATF agents asking for a ceasefire to get their wounded out because they're being so horribly outgunned. Do you send them in the second time the exact same way? Do you send them in the second time walking across an open field, a perfect ambush site? Or do you try to protect them? Do you, would you send your son or your daughter in the second time just walking across an open field with, with a warrant saying, Gosh, David, you're just a horribly misunderstood nice guy who, okay, so you like 11-year-old girls, and maybe you've held a few people here against your will, and maybe you got a couple of legal immigrants here, and maybe old oh, 50 to 100 illegal machine guns, but you're really a nice guy, and I'm going to send my son and my daughter out here walking across this open field because I trust you. Are you talking about when the FBI went in in armored vehicles? Is that I'm, your I'm question? About, yes, sir, the second raid. I have no Isn't there some justification it. for trying to save the, the, the arm? I have no problem with that. Okay. But let me say something, because we're on national television. You said General Mundy. Yes, the sir. new commandant is a classmate of mine from the Naval Academy named Chuck Krulak. He would be real mad at me if I didn't point that out Yes, to sir. And I, and I, I only say that because I don't know if General Krulak has some sons in the service. He, I he do does, know. and you're right, and there's nothing wrong with them as far as if that were what they were doing, just using it to protect their people. We can we get to how they were used later on the 19th of April. I have a different opinion. But would you send them in with no protection? No, sir. Okay, I want to make that perfectly clear. And I, I would not want your children treated that way who are serving our country. I'm going to ask you, since you were defense lawyers for a Davidian and what has now become the Davidian, same question I've asked everybody else. Have you seen anything or heard anything that would lead you to believe or read anything that justifies the murder of those four ATF agents and the 20 more who were wounded by the Branch Davidians by David Koresh and his followers on the morning of February 28th. Yes, sir. Yes, tell, sir. All right, tell me what it is, sir. Because the you're jury the in San Antonio, the jury in San Antonio found that the killings of the four agents were in self-defense. They were acquitted of murder, sir. Did you know that? They were acquitted of murder and acquitted of conspiracy to commit murder. Every single uh, defendant, all 11, were acquitted of murder. So that's why we're answering that that way, because obviously there's evidence Mr. that didn't convince a jury. Weren't the Menendez brothers acquitted? Is our no, judicial no, sir, system perfect? So. No. Are you going to tell me that every murderer in this country who's walked was really innocent? Well, you asked me, did we know of anything that would say that they weren't guilty of murder? And the answer is yes. Everything we just told you, plus a okay. jury's verdict after a six-week well, trial. Let me bring you closer to Mr. Zimmerman. Those weren't ATF agents. Those were your two children who were sworn to protect this country in a different branch of the service. Yeah. And they did what those ATF agents did. Yes. Was it justifiable for David Koresh to kill your kids? I wasn't there, but if the, if the ATF accidentally or however opened fire on people in their home and all they did was defend themselves in their home, then under the law, that's justifiable homicide. It's not murder. Mr. Ehrlich is being, is recognized for five minutes. Sir, this is why I, didn't want, I did not want to get into this. This is a very emotional issue. We have compelling testimony on both sides. Uh, it's a very difficult issue that each and every member of, this, of these panels has to struggle with. Uh, and just for the last minute here, let me make the record clear. Sir, is this your testimony as a result of interviews with the jury foreman or individual jurors that they came to a conclusion with respect to who shot first. And my follow-up is, was there a jury interrogatory with respect to who shot first? And what were the uh, instructions from the judge? To answer your second question, there's just a general verdict of guilty or not guilty on each of the separate charges. There wasn't a question about who shot first. And yes, Sarah Bain, the foreman of that jury, said they were not able to decide who shot first. May, may I make a comment, though? Cause, yes, sir. Cause I, I'd like to keep us all focused. I think we have the hearings are going right to what uh, uh, Congressman Schumer had said should be. Let's focus on law enforcement so that we can increase their statutes. We don't want 
None of us want the FBI or the ATF to be uh, destroyed by this. We want their, it, and, and them to be enhanced by it. If, who fired first is really irrelevant because you need to look at that ATF plan. I, I look at it if, if just like uh, Congressman Taylor said, if those were my sons, and by the way, one of those four who were killed was one of my Marines. He was a reserve, reserve uh, Marine. We ought to look at it and say, is that a faulty plan? Uh, was there something wrong with the way the ATF conducted that? Even if they were ambushed, which I don't think they were, but even if they were, how silly is that to have an operation in an open area like that with no cover when you suspect people to have 50 caliber machine guns and automatic weapons and then just sacrifice those people like that? You know, if that kind of operation order were given by a Marine second lieutenant going through the basic school, they'd transfer the guy to the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let, let, let me tell you, sir, I, I appreciate your comments, both of you, because the purpose of these hearings are twofold, and it's certainly not to denigrate law enforcement, it's to find the facts as best we can or arrive at, at our own individual opinions and to make sure, as I prefaced my remarks along the same lines, that changes have been made so that something like this could never happen again, and that's certainly the twin purposes of these hearings. Uh, my time is running out, and I have a question for uh, Mr. Uh, Degarian. Mr. Degarian, this is the classic Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning quarterback question. But let me ask it anyway. Would you describe, sir, in your own mind, your opinion with respect to the issue of how, what could have been done to get the Davidians out of that compound without bloodshed? We were on the way to doing that. On April the 14th, there was a major breakthrough. And that breakthrough was David Korsh's letter to me, which I promptly gave to the FBI, that said that he'd received his mission, that he was working on writing his interpretation of the seven seals, and that everyone inside was relieved that they didn't have to die now, that the prophecies were not being fulfilled now, and that this would be resolved. And I talked with Steve Schneider uh, on the telephone about that. I talked with the survivors later, and the, the, the mood on the inside had definitely changed on the night of the 13th and the morning of the 14th of April. I had those letters uh, reviewed by Dr. Tabor, by Dr. Arnold, they agreed that this was a major change in what had gone on in, in, the, in this uh, religious view that was so overpowering all of those people in there. They believed that they could not do anything except what their religion told them to do. But, but sir, let me ask you how do you respond to what in my view is a very legitimate observation and rejoinder to, to your observation that you're dealing with a con artist, you're dealing with a guy who was desperate, you're dealing with a guy who knew he was looking at a very long prison sentence if he walked out of that compound, uh, someone who was uh, a real bad character, or had sex with kids, the whole nine yards, who had lied on a consistent basis. How does your opinion jive with those facts? Uh, I'm not going to, again, try to defend David Koresh, but what he told me about factual matters and about religious matters all panned out. What he told me about what had happened, his ability to relate the facts to me and for me to check those facts, all panned out. We were not dealing simply with David Koresh, but we were also dealing with Steve Schneider, a former teacher of comparative religion, with Wayne Martin, a Harvard Law graduate. They were, they were rational, they were reasonable, and they had this this religious uh, compulsion that was not understood by the negotiators and that was not appreciated as being serious. It was serious. They were sincere about that. I see my time's about to run now. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank the both of you for your appearance here today and for your factual opinions uh, given to this panel and this country in an unemotional way, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Scott from Virginia has five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. 
I'd ask uh, both of the attorneys if you were involved in the trial of the um, no, sir. aftermath. N uh, neither of us were lawyers. I was called as a witness, uh, Mr. Congressman. Uh, you indicated that there were, did you indicate that there was a finding of self-defense or finding of not guilty? Finding, finding of not guilty. Uh, uh, in the criminal trial, usually there's just a, a general verdict and it was a fine, uh, the only defense to the murder and conspiracy to murder was self-defense. Well, you could have also had um, uh, a finding that these Davidians weren't responsible for the killing of the officers. However, others, had they been in trial, would have been guilty. Is that accurate? That, that's uh, possible, but uh, they were also found, or some of them were found guilty of voluntary manslaughter. And that, the judge, uh, it, well, it was, a, it was a mixed finding. But self-defense, the judge only applied self-defense to conspiracy to murder and murder. And they were acquitted, or everyone was acquitted of those offenses. Uh, Mr. Scott, or mm -hmm. Congressman Scott, I don't know if this will help you understand the context of that, though, but from the well, opening well, the, the statement... Context, wait a minute, let, me, let me tell you the context is in response to Mr. Taylor's question where he said that they were justified, that there was justification for killing uh, law enforcement officers. Right. And you used the verdict as uh, your, as your ra rationale. No, sir, his question was, do you have you known anything? Do you have you read anything? Have you heard anything that would provide justification for murder? And I said they were not convicted of murder. And what I was going to add to you, sir, was that the prosecution's theory from the opening statement on was that everybody in the place, all of these people were all responsible, and they said, we will put a weapon in every person's hand well, in that trial. Let me get to the, some physical evidence. Have you seen, you, did you indicate that you'd seen the door, that, um, the front door? Yes, sir. And yes. you saw uh, bullet holes all going one way, is that what I understood you to say? I said most of the bullet holes. So there were, bullet, there were bullet holes going both ways? Uh, there were. There were no bullet holes in the, uh, that I noticed in the left-hand door. This was a double door, and it opened, uh, if you're facing the <coughs> compound as these photographs are, the door on the right of the double door is the only one that operated. It opened uh, inward. Uh, but uh, are you sure that there are bullet holes most of them going in, is that your testimony? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In fact, I didn't see any coming the other way, to be honest with you, because there was a barricade by the time I got up there. I didn't see any coming the other direction. <coughs> but yeah. Mr. DeGaran did. So I think we may be able to get the door, so we can... Sir, if you can well, get sure, that make door... Sure, make sure that you get the correct door. The door that survived for the trial was the door on the left, and the door on the right disappeared. It has to be the door on the right. That's where I saw the bullet holes. The door on the left was stationary. And the way that it happened, as explained to me by Korish, we have a tape here that, in which he explains it was, he stepped out and onto the porch and was met by gunfire from the agents and then went back inside and slammed the door. And he pointed out those bullet holes to me. Those are the, that, that's the door on the right-hand side. It's the door that had the, the door handle. And the, uh, the door that survived for the trial <coughs> was the wrong door. I'll yield uh, for a minute to the gentleman from New York. Or let's just take this hypothetical, gentlemen, and that is that the ATF agents advance on the compound. The Davidians shoot from the windows. They're not going to shoot through the door. Exactly, and sir. The, and then in response, the ATF agents shoot back. Of course, the majority of bullet holes would yeah. be through would be going in that direction because the Davidians are not going to keep the door closed and shoot through it. Oh, they wouldn't, back. would they? So they all the bullet holes, of course, should be going in one direction. That's not the issue. The issue is who fired out of the windows first, and I appreciate the gentleman Re yielding. Reclaiming my time, let me, let me change subjects a minute. Do, do either one of you question the validity of the search warrant or the arrest warrant? Yes. Yes. And what is your challenge of the validity? Uh, vagueness, stale information. Uh, there were, uh, and, and let me make clear here that I think the panel has been somewhat misled by by thinking that there was no challenge to the search warrant. What the judge held was that the challenge to the search warrant was moot. That is, it didn't make any difference because the ATF 
nor the FBI was not claiming to want to introduce any evidence gained as a result of the serving of that search warrant. So it didn't matter uh, well, to the if, issues in the trial, and thus it wasn't litigated. If under the Leon rule was a much to litigate, even if it was illegal, would it make any difference? If it was deliberately falsified under Franks it, versus Delaware, then it, Leon it, would not apply. If it were just illegal, but in good faith illegal, was there any point <laughs> in um, litigating it? Well, you know, I've got a philosophical argument that you can't have a, a good faith illegal. Uh, but but I'm, uh, I'm, uh, you'll admit Supreme that under the agree. Leon rule, there's not much point in uh, litigating it. And I would ask you if you have a situation where you want to challenge police practices as being illegal, um, how do we protect innocent people if we can't have a viable exclusionary rule? We, we need a viable exclusionary rule, and Leon is an abomination uh, in, in our criminal jurisprudence. Scott, uh, if you have access to that door, could you get it? And also the missing tape of the 28th? You said you thought we could get I, the door. I understand that it was, uh, in, it was not introduced in court. We're looking for the door that's missing. If you can get it, you know where it is, please bring it. I'll do the Thank best you. I can, Mr. Chairman. Chair now uh, recognizes Mr. Shabbat of Ohio. Will the gentleman yield? If the reporters from the Waco Tribune and the lady who said she was held against her will uh, show up with the door, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I would they all be admitted and are allowed to testify at about the same time, Mr. Chairman? I, Chair, thanks the gentleman from Mississippi for uh, those uh, outstanding remarks. Uh, Mr. Shabbat, please, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before I yield, uh, I'd just like to comment that periodically during these hearings, uh, we've heard it insinuated that one side or the other uh, is more pro or less pro law enforcement than the other side. And I would just hope that everyone here shares the goal that we should learn as much as we can from the mistakes that were made at Waco so that we can protect the lives of both law enforcement personnel and civilians. And with that, I'd like to uh, yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Howard Coble. I thank the gentleman from Ohio for yielding. Gentlemen, good to have you all with us. Mr. Zimmerman, it may be because of my advancing age, but you don't look old enough to be a grandpa. Thank you, sir. But it's I good, it's good to have you here nonetheless. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to extend before I put my questions to these gentlemen to what the gentleman from Ohio said. I'm trying my darndest to keep my composure during these hearings, but it is becoming increasingly difficult. Yesterday, an associate stopped me on my way from the floor, and he said, I'm getting tired of you Republicans and one Democrat trying to bash law enforcement. Well, as my grandma used to say, that made my coffee taste real bad. <laughs> I said to him, I said, what, on what do you base this? I said, how much of the hearings have you observed? Oh, I've seen none of it on television, he replied. I only read it in the newspaper. I said to him, I said, friend, for your information, as far as I can tell, no Republicans nor Democrats, for that matter, are bashing law enforcement. And I am about to lose my composure now. But here's a man, a well-informed citizen, already rushed to conclusion, having not watched one second of the hearings. Oh, but he read it in the printed media. Well, he needs to either start reading other newspapers, I told him, or find time in his schedule to watch these hearings. Mr. Zimmerman, as you pointed out, the word is enhanced. I'm not bashing law enforcement, and neither are my colleagues. And last week, many of the questions were framed in such a way to imply that those of us who endorsed these hearings in some way were sympathetic to Koresh, and I resented that as well. Mr. DeGuerin, as you pointed out, we're not here to, de to defend Koresh. But having said that, I want to pick up where the gentleman from Maryland left off. Well, strike that. Let me say one more thing while I got my temper boiling. Someone on, uh, earlier talked about Monday morning quarterback as though it were uh, an indictable offense. 
Folks, that's what hearings are all about. Hearings provide us with the luxury of applying 2020 hindsight. If no mistakes were ever committed, there would be no need for hearings. Sure, we're applying Monday morning quarterbacking. Sure, we're applying 2020 hindsight, hoping, Mr. Zimmerman, as you pointed out, to enhance the reputation of these federal agents. I don't like the idea that the ATF and the FBI are blasted and bashed. Now, having said all that, back to Koresh, Mr. DeGuren. If I were hosting a, a hamburger cookout in my neighborhood Saturday night, I don't believe Koresh would make the cut on my guest list. I don't think I'd want him there. Having said that, do you and, I, and you were talking to the gentleman from Maryland about this, I, apparently you believe that he was sincere in his religious convictions based upon your conversations with him. Is that a valid conclusion? Yes, sir. Something that has bothered me, and this is the third time I've mentioned it, is the, the non-arrest of this fellow. He was the nerve center of the compound. It was always my belief if they, if they could have taken him under custody and control of the ATF or whoever, got him out of there, get the charismatic leader away from the compound, and then conduct your search. The Treasury report said, on the one hand, oh, he never left the compound, so therefore we couldn't arrest him. Well, at the criminal trial, it became apparent that he did, in fact, leave the compound. Then the Treasury's defense subsequently was, well, it wouldn't have been a good idea to have arrested him because if we had evidence would likely have been destroyed, and other agents, I think, said that, th that the Davidians would have resisted. Is it your belief, Mr. DeGuerin, that he could have, in fact, been arrested beyond the confines of the compound? I, I do believe that he could have been, and, and I investigated that and talked to people who had seen him on the outside. Uh, the, the local service station that was just a few miles away had seen him uh, very recently and, and frequently. He jogged out in the neighborhood almost on a daily basis. Uh, he went to a local uh, bar and pub in, in Waco called the Chelsea Pub. People there remembered seeing him in the weeks uh, immediately before the raid. He, he had been seen all over the place. The, what, the, what the Treasury report ac accurately says is the, the, uh, the undercover operation, or the, excuse me, the surveillance operation didn't accurately record whether he came or went. They abandoned the idea of arresting him outside, I think, because they wanted to arrest him with a big show. Mr. DeGuerin, my time, my time for this segment has expired. We'll pick up on that subsequently. Thank you, Mr. Coble. Chair now recognizes Mrs. Slaughter from New York. I'd like to divide my time this morning. Two minutes to Mr. Taylor, three minutes to Mr. Green, if we can find him. He's with the door, Gene. Go ahead, Gene. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Slaughter. Mr. Zimmerman, in your capacity as a JAG officer, are you normally on the prosecuting side or the defense side? I was the chief prosecutor of the 2nd Marine Division for a okay. period of time and the chief defense counsel of Force Troops Atlantic, sir. So you've done both? Done both, and okay. trial judge. As a defense attorney, and you're obviously very good at it, and, and as is Mr. DeGarren, would you be offended? Or let me take it a step further. Would you move for a mistrial or for the sentence to be thrown out if only the prosecution was allowed to call witnesses and you had evidence, compelling evidence, in defense of your person, but you weren't allowed to submit it in court? I would always ask permission to uh, put on whatever evidence I had, sir. So, in the case of this raid, and there is compelling evidence in the case of the reporters who wrote the story that appeared in the Waco paper, they were so afraid for their lives that they left town. The paper changed the locks, they issued new security measures, they take the markings off their vehicles so that the Davidians won't be able to identify their vehicles as being a part of that paper. There's a woman who claims to have been held against her will for three months by Koresh and his followers. There is another who says Koresh is compiling a hit list of former members that he wants to have, and I'm using his word, eliminated. 
That's pretty compelling stuff. Now, on behalf of those four dead ATF, ATF agents and the 20 who were wounded, don't you think in fairness as a defense attorney, they ought to be allowed to submit that evidence to this body? That, that would be similar to the question the judge would have to make as to the, whether it, witnesses are material. And, and I think that what we'd have to do to answer your question is, what's the focus of this investigation that you're doing now? And if it was material, then you should have those people. If it's not material, it would be just like at court. A judge might say, I'm going to deny your motion for subpoena because these witnesses aren't material. I would try to show they were material in my, if you're asking me what I would do. But I don't always persuade the judges to do the right thing. Mr. Zimmerman, let's get back. I don't know. I didn't call these hearings. I'm here. I think some good things. I'm, yes, ma'am. Mr. Green. Thank you. I'd like to thank my colleague for yielding time. Uh, Mr. Guerin, Mr. Zimmerman, and I, your reputation obviously is well earned in Houston and the Texas courts. And, and as Mr. Taylor said, y'all are very good defense attorneys. And having seen you in the halls once in a while when I used to practice law, your reputation is there. Let me ask a little bit about um, Mr. Zimmerman about the defending themselves. And, and I have some problems with uh, somebody breaking into my home, you know, and, and I have the right to defend myself. And your uh, response is Mr. Taylor's question. Um, on who fired the first shot. But anyway, if someone is charging up to my house and they're wearing ATF, you know, vest or, or jackets or whatever else they have, and do I have the right to, you know, to respond to them and, and uh, whether they're in police uniform or whether they're wearing an ATF jacket or, or something like that? And again, as a lawyer, tell me because one of my concerns and from my constituents is, is that we have the right to defend ourselves in our home. And if somebody is breaking in, how do we know that they are police officers? Particularly in Texas, we have so many different kinds of police officer uniforms. That's that, right. Uh, and, and, and I can't give you an answer that would apply everywhere, sir, but the answer bit is what was the conduct of the police officers on the raid? Uh, my memory is from the videotapes that, that, uh, the, that the ATF was on the back, not on the front. And there be, might be some question of whether they were ATF We were agents shown a vest here that day that had, I believe, ATF on the front okay. of the vest. The, now, the identity not, probably wouldn't be the issue. The issue is what they were doing, because this was daylight. If somebody comes in in a military-type military attack and fires first and lays down automatic weapons fire like we believe was done on that front door, then I believe the law in Texas okay. would allow you to defend yourself. If they just come up and say, we're here to search, serve a search warrant. You have no right to resist that with force. Okay. None. The, uh, the best evidence we have so far are the live witnesses who are here. Of course, the ATF agents said that you know, sit at another table, but at the same setting, that they did not uh, fire first. And it's your testimony that the Davidians in your interview with them and Mr. Guerin, you said you talked to them 10 times. And of course, they're not here. And the best evidence we have is that uh, it's from the, the ATF agents who were there. Let me get one more question in before my time actually runs out on the bullet holes in the ceiling again there was no testimony even from one of the uh, uh, ATF agents in the helicopters that there were any uh, shots fired from the choppers when you said there were shots in the ceiling it could have been from either someone on the roof or did you look at them again Mr. Guerin you said that you've hunted all your life and you can tell whether there are shots incoming or outgoing if it's a wood roof it and was, well let me let me correct that it was a uh, sheetrock ceiling okay and you could tell from the way the sheet rock was punched out down that it was, it was bullets in. that had come down that had punched that out now um, I asked the Davidians to take photographs of that because I wanted to preserve that as evidence and I asked the Rangers when they did their search to please note that ceiling uh, because I expected it to to survive of course it didn't but it was clear to me and clear to Jack that those were incoming rounds. Now, there was no one on that roof. Never was. It's a flat roof. It's, uh, you can't see it in that uh, yeah. photograph, but well, it, we've was seen other photographs it was the highest the structure in the neighborhood. The only way that those bullets could have been made was from someone standing on a roof shooting down or someone shooting from the helicopters. Could, could I have gentlemen's time has expired? Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Satter. Five minutes. I thank the gentleman from Indiana. 
Gentlemen, as you all can tell by the, by the format here, we have to do this in segments. Mr. DeGuerin, you were wrapping up about, about the lack of arrest of Koresh. If you will continue what you were saying. I'm there. sorry, I, someone coughed and I didn't hear you. I say you were wrapping up in response to my question concerning why Koresh was never taken into custody. If you'll conclude that. Well, uh, frankly, I, I think it was because some of the supervisors wanted to continue and make a big show that this went off. I, and I think that, uh, this is editorializing, I think we need to focus on not why the raid went bad necessarily. We know why it went bad. The surprise was lost. But why it was planned that way in the first place. Excessive force, provocative force, provokes, as the word implies, a, a violent response. I, I might be able to get you to hit me if I came up and was provocative enough to you, but whose fault is that? Is that my fault or your fault for hitting me when I provoke you? My point is that this dynamic entry, which really means a military-style raid, was wrong from the beginning. Ask the, ask the FBI agents, ask Jeff Jamar, who was the agent in charge, if the ATF had asked him in advance, should we do a dynamic entry there, he would have said no. If you just don't do a raid like this on a building that had over 50 rooms, 130 residents, women and children, because you cannot get all those rooms and all those people secure quick enough. Not only is surprise important, but speed is important. And if you Mr. can't get them, you've got a hostage situation. I, I think that's been changed, we learned yesterday. Let, let me put this to you and Mr. Zimmerman both. Just prior to the, to the big raid, the firestorm, I believe you, were, you all were in negotiations with the FBI uh, on a regular basis, were you not? We yes, were sir. speaking with them. We were not negotiating on behalf of anybody. We were just ser serving as lawyers trying to get them out and into the courthouse. Okay, if you will, from either of you, tell us how that progressed, whether or not the FBI was cooperative with you, whether they were deceptive with you, did they mislead you, were they above board? Let us hear about that. I, let me say that the, that the FBI treated me cordially with respect uh, throughout my discussions with them. And I think that it was a, a difficult decision for Jeff Jamar to make to allow a defense lawyer to go in to, uh, you know, defense lawyers aren't real popular with FBI agents, and I'm sure there was some dissension in the ranks about allowing that to happen. But he saw it as a possible solution. We had parallel interests. I wanted a live client in court, and he wanted it to end without violence and to get everybody in, in custody. And we, we really worked hard at doing that. I thought we were really on the road to getting that done. The FBI was above board with me. They didn't let me in on any of their secrets, but the, why should they? They, they treated me with uh, respect. Uh, when I came out and asked questions about what would happen and what would be the conditions, not as a way to negotiate, they were very forthcoming with me. And uh, for instance, on the first, uh, first full day that I went in, I came back out, asked to see the sheriff to find out about the jail conditions, and within 10 minutes, I was put in a car uh, on a Walmart parking lot with a sheriff so I could talk to him. Um, so to answer your question, they were very forthcoming and, and uh, straight up with me. Mr. Zimmerman? I, I echo that. Uh, I was a few days behind Mr. DeGarren because their theory was we're going to try at the beginning to use our own negotiators. That lasted about three or four weeks. Then the next step was we're going to let Mr. Koresh's lawyer come in and see if he can do it. And then Dick had requested my assistance because Steve Schneider was doing most of the talking, if you know, and he was my client. As an ethical lawyer, he didn't want to be talking to another lawyer's client. They were very professional to us. And I'll say this, I, I don't want to take up more of your time, but in okay. my written statement, I make that statement. I have publicly stated I have great admiration for the FBI. Well, gentlemen, how about the loud music, the playing of the loud music? Anybody want to be heard on that? That was the wrong tactic. It was the wrong tactic. When, when you're trying to create trust between the FBI and the, uh, and the uh, Davidians, then you don't try to uh, 
p punish them or torture them at the same time. Wait, and you I all ever was... ask about about the advisability of that? It, it's no, it's not advisable under that circumstance. Under what we've had in, going on in Waco, that was the wrong tactic. Increasing that pressure rather than drive them away from David Koresh had the, the effect of bonding them closer together, shared, sharing a terrible experience, like basic training, for instance. You, you bond together. People from diverse backgrounds, no matter how different they are, will bond together with that kind of experience, and that's exactly what the FBI was doing. It was wrong, and the second reason it was wrong is because it played right into this apocalyptic vision that they had. The end was coming uh, with, with chariots of fire, with uh, giant beasts breathing fire and here are these tanks going around there breathing fire it just played right into this apocalyptic vision that was the wrong tactic so so I guess what what they had hoped to, to do would be to separate Koresh from his followers in, in effect resulted in a cohesive binding probably is that what you're saying yes sir yes. I agree the red light illuminates again mr. chairman I'll conclude for the moment <laughs> thank you uh, mr. Coble uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Watt from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I want to express my thanks to the witnesses for being here and uh, the candor with which they have presented their statements up to this point. Uh, um, I want to, I uh, think it was Mr. DeGuerin uh, who um, has indicated that he thought the dynamic entry was just a bad um, mistake. Um, and throughout the hearing, uh, I've been periodically, when I have a chance to ask questions, um, um, trying to, to identify our legislative uh, nexus here, uh, what, what it is we're trying to accomplish. I take it that um, there is nothing we could do legislatively uh, that would directly bear on whether uh, a dynamic entry in a situation of this kind would be appropriate or not. Um, I did hear Secretary Benson, or former Secretary Benson, when he was here, say that um, um, as a result of what happened at Waco, um, the uh, Treasury implemented a uh, uh, one or more rule changes um, having to do with the level of supervision and, and uh, uh, the level of reporting responsibility uh, between ATF and folks further up in the supervisory chain, uh, I suppose we could have, a as a Congress, ordered a more direct level of supervision, uh, but they have done, done that now before we got to these hearings. Can you identify um, anything that you, either of you, thinks that we ought to be doing legislatively um, in response to uh, the Waco incident. Uh, and I would invite you specifically to, to talk about, uh, uh, in terms of the, the level of supervision that was there, uh, but also to give me your thoughts uh, legislatively in, in terms of uh, um, what we can do to assure individual rights uh, against uh, surges and seizures that, uh, that are unreasonable. And uh, I would ask you also to comment uh, uh, if you are aware of um, the specifics of um, the bill that we previously uh, passed out of the House in this session of Congress, uh, I think it was House Bill 666. Uh, uh, I, I invite you to give me your comments on whether that helps us in protecting individual rights uh, or whether 
we have done a disservice to uh, the rights of American citizens. Well, uh, one thing I can uh, beg that you not do is do away with the exclusionary rule. I, I think that's uh, the only thing that, that has been shown to be effective in enforcing the Fourth Amendment. Uh, I, was, I was very encouraged to hear Director McGall say yesterday that he's already instituted uh, within the Treasury Department the requirement, or within ATF, the requirement that uh, they uh, confer with other agencies. And secondly, I was very happy to hear him say that uh, in the future, dynamic entry will be done only as a very last resort. Uh, as legislatively, what can you do? Gee, I don't know. Uh, if, you can re if you can undo Leon, uh, that would be a, a giant step in the right direction. Explain that for me uh, well, so that I make sure all of, uh, particularly the members of the uh, Judiciary Committee understand that, and maybe uh, the the members of the American public might understand it. Can you can you put that just in yes, sir. in simple everyday language that maybe the American people can understand? Basically, what Leon says is, if you've got a search warrant uh, and you act on it, uh, then uh, you're acting in good faith, and you can't challenge the illegality of the search warrant. As practicing lawyers, we know that usually judges rubber stamp the applications search warrant and the only thing the, the way we made progress in uh, the jurisprudence of this country was requiring search warrant applications to be accurate and to have enough probable cause in them to justify a supposedly neutral and detached magistrate into authorizing uh, a search but if but Leon wipes that out if you got some uh, judge that uh, is doesn't carefully read the search warrants, and, and uh, cynically I say that happens all the time, then he just rubber stamps it and, you go, and, and that's the end of the inquiry. It shouldn't and, be and the what, end of the inquiry. what impact would uh, House Bill 666 have on Leon? If, I'm, if I'm not know. familiar with Do you, you know, Mr. Zane? I, I believe in general, I understand it deals something with lessening the, uh, the uh, requirements uh, for federal law enforcement officers only as it relates to search and seizure, but that's about all the detail that I know. A am I thinking of the right bill? Best May I answer your other question, though? Mr. DeGuerin has answered the second part. I don't, I I'm answering the question about what can you legislate that might prevent ATF repeat. I don't think you can legislate judgment, but I think that what you can do in your oversight responsibility are two things. Change the procedure that led to Waco and change the leadership that lay to week Waco. Now, they came in and told you yesterday that they've already changed the procedure. All right, we have to give, take their word on that. They're professional law enforcement officers. But I can tell you what, the American public does not buy that they've changed the leadership because nobody has been disciplined in a meaningful way. There's been no criminal prosecutions, and people have committed felony offenses. Mr. Mervetti told you yesterday that two of those agents in charge of this raid committed federal felony offenses. There's been no prosecution, and there's been no meaningful discipline. And those people are still ATF agents. They work for all of us. We pay their salary, and I'm still paying Sarabin's salary and Wasnowski's salary, and I don't like that. Those people should be removed from their positions. Now, on the FBI, we haven't had a chance to address the FBI, and we're going to be gone pretty soon, so I hope we can get some questions about the FBI pretty soon. There has been no one disciplined because of Waco in the entire United States Department of Justice chain of command. That's horrible. Ten people died on February 28th, 80 people died on April the 19th, and no one's been disciplined. No policies have been changed. The only thing they've done is they've asked for more money to double the hostage rescue team size. That's ridiculous. So what you can do, change the policies, change the leadership. It has not happened. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. The uh, gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Coble, will resume questioning for five minutes. Thank the gentleman. In the fall of 1993, Treasury and Justice issued their respective reports about Waco. And I'm paraphrasing now, but Treasury, in effect, said, well, ATF blew it. We were the bad guys. FB Justice, on the other hand, uh, exonerates the FBI. Well, folks, when I, read, when I got those two reports, 
I hate to admit it, but I guess four or five weeks in this town, one, if you don't develop a severe case of paranoia, you're a rare bird indeed. I thought this is all too coincidental. One group conveniently assuming blame, the other group waltz, waltzing away with no blame. I think, as I told the Attorney General, I said everybody who touched the ball at Waco fumbled it. Now, having said that, gentlemen, one or both of you, I believe, and I don't think this is in either report to which I referred, you all were involved in a surrender plan with the FBI. We, had one, we had one already arranged and agreed Tell to. us, I'd like to hear about that. About what the proposed plan was? Yeah. Most of that was proposed by the FBI, and Dick and I made only very minor suggested changes which they incorporated, but the plan in general was this. The People on the inside were going to tell us, tell the FBI the night before. Dick and I were going to be there. We're going to start during daylight, so this is all done during the day. And Dick DeGaron and David Koresh were going to exit first to show everybody that they weren't going to get executed the minute they stepped outside. And there would be a metal detector set up outside the front door and a bus 100 or so yards away, approximately. When Mr. DeGuerin and Mr. Koresh went through that metal detector, then Mr. Koresh would have plastic res uh, wrist restraints placed on him, be patted down by a male FBI or ATF agent, F FBI was our request, and then he, would, he and Dick would go to the, to the bus, and then I was supposed to stay in there and then see that the other adults came out, keeping a distance so that law enforcement wouldn't get nervous about people bunching up. It was going to be tape recorded by the FBI, and it was going to be a press representative there taping it so that there'd be no claims of police brutality and there'd be no claims uh, that uh, uh, the, the opposite. In other words, both sides would be uh, uh, protected. And then as that went through, Steve Schneider would be the last branch of Vidian out and I would bring up the rear. When they saw me coming through there, that was the signal to send in the HRT teams. They'd come in, make sure nobody else was hiding anywhere. Once they cleared that, then that EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal Team, was going to come in, check for booby traps, make sure there wasn't of that. Then the feds were gone. The Texas Rangers were going to take over. And the people who were wounded or needed medical care go to a hospital. Everybody else goes to the command post where a United States Magistrate Judge was going to be there, and they'd be warned, taken into official custody, appointed a lawyer, or released if they weren't charged with anything. And the only suggestion that I can remember, and maybe Dick can, can add to this, but the only suggestion I remember us making was, I said, I'm uncomfortable about those little kids walking out by themselves. Can't we let the kids walk out with their mothers? And they agreed to that. So that was all worked out in my judgment. We had a deal. We were going to do it. We told them on the 14th they were coming out. We told them it would take another 10, 12 days. We asked them, do you have that much time? They said, we have all the time in the world to resolve this peacefully. Well, what frustrated the plan, gentlemen? Some desk-bound bureaucrat in Washington overrode those people's judgment down there. Mr. DeGuerin, do you want to add to that? I, I don't know exactly how the decision was made, uh, but uh, obviously they decided and someone pushed for it, and that's what you ought to find out. Someone pushed for a plan to send tear gas, and not just regular tear gas, CS gas, which has been banned for use in international warfare. We can't use it against our worst enemies, but they use it against those kids. Somebody pushed for that plan, and it was too soon. It would have ended peacefully, in my opinion. I don't know who made that decision. That's for you to find out, and I hope that you can find that out. I don't know whether it was done on full information. I don't think it was done on the information that we had. We tried to get the information to them, about uh, this religious aspect and the sincerity of that coming to pass and them coming out. Um, what, that's what frustrated it. Someone wanted to end it by forcing an end rather than letting it end. Mr. Zimmerman, I yes, almost sir. feel sick to my stomach when I hear you say how close that could have almost within your grasp. And if that could have been executed as you just laid it out, this hearing probably would never have been called. We wouldn't be here if the FBI had waited 10 more days. I, I shouldn't say the FBI. If the Department of Justice would have waited 10 more days, and, and, and if they didn't come out, where, what, how much farther down the line would we have been? What would have been lost by waiting 10 days? 
I don't know if this is the appropriate time to tell you, but I, I heard uh, Mr. Noble talk about those funerals, and I believe he was sincere about it. But I got to tell you that this has not been a pleasant experience for Dick DeGaren and me, because the Branch Davidians had families. They had people that loved them. One of the worst things that I can remember about this was a phone call from Israel, from Shulamet Cohen, the mother of Pablo Cohen, who had just been there, came over from Israel, and as far as he was concerned, was there from one of those, remember somebody described a group as musicians and so forth and so on, no. he was in that group. When the press reported after the fire that I had represented Steve Schneider, apparently on CNN, everybody in Israel was watching this, I got a call from Ms. Cohen, and between her sobs to ask me if I had seen Pablo, and I had. Dick and I had talked to him on April the 4th, and there had been a tape from his mother. And one of the things that we asked the FBI to do, which they agreed to do, was bring that return tape out with the legal documents and the letter that was addressed to Dick. And I told her about that. And then she described for me an Israeli Jew talking to an American Jewish lawyer, watching that gas be inserted into that building, watching an American tank knock down an American house and then it burst into flames. And you imagine the images in an Israeli's mind with the Holocaust survivors in Israel? I couldn't answer. I think you can tell from today, it's not often that I'm without words. Gentlemen. I could not explain to her how that happened. And her answer, her question was, I thought he would be safe in America. Gentlemen, gentlemen, the gentlemen's red time has expired. I, I thank you. I want to, th Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank these gentlemen for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, what, I have no time to yield back, but thank you, you Mr. Sure Chairman. You sure don't. <laughs> you got pretty good for your five minutes, though. Uh, the chair now yields to the gentlelady from Texas, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, and I understand you have a piece of uh, audio visual. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much, and I wish as the gentleman from North Carolina I might uh, be so lucky as to have those minutes yielded to me. So, gentlemen, I'm going to have to talk very quickly. I would like uh, number 32 to be brought over to me, but as I begin, let me um, say that uh, the compelling uh, statements are such uh, from both of you having been inside um, is uh, not in my purview to try and overcome both the emotion uh, and as well the overwhelming feeling on the loss of life. I will simply acknowledge that we lost lives. I'd like to join, however, my colleague uh, Chuck Schumann to say that I wish you were here yesterday, and I think you're right, Mr. Zimmerman. You need to either continue with us, and I know your time is limited because much of what you have to say deals with the FBI and the Department of Justice, and we should get to that. Let me, um, I'm not sure where it is as it comes, um, be able to, be able to uh, just uh, see if we can concede on, on a point of confusion, uh, because that's why we are at these hearings, and uh, I hope that maybe at the end of these hearings we won't have confusion, but when those um, uh, ATF officers testified yesterday, they were moving toward the door uh, to serve uh, a search warrant. And as they moved toward the door to serve that search warrant, they testified that shots came out. I know you have since indicated that there may have been the possibility of them shooting first, meaning these ATF agents, but it could have just as well been the door closing, slamming the door, and shots coming out the door. Maybe you said something differently, so I need to understand that. Because I don't think this picture gives us any evidence of who shot first. And, and what I'm going to tell you may not tell you who shot first, but I'm telling you my experience it does. The testimony at the trial was, is as the agent, and he didn't say this yesterday, and out of fairness to him, he wasn't asked this. But the testimony was that as he walked up after David Koresh closed the door, remember he did tell David came out, said something, the door closed. The testimony trial was, is then fire erupted from inside and it all came out that front door, the right-hand side of that front door, and that's what wounded people. The, the bullets came from the inside through the closed door, which is what I was trying to convey to, to Mr. Schumer because he's absolutely right. That makes little sense to me, and I don't think the jury bought it either because, as Dick said, now, one of those pictures, that picture right up there, you see that person sitting there with his head about 18 I inches? I and I want to keep us on this oh, okay. one well, bit, because this you is see the one the, that we referred to. Okay, you see the, the bullet holes in the right-hand side of the door uh, yes. as you face it? 
The ATF agent's theory was that the bullets came through that door from the inside. What Dick and I saw were bullet holes in that right side, right where David Koresh had been standing, as we were told by the Davidians, but they weren't coming from the inside, they were going from the outside in. That's why we believe that, uh, uh, that what the Branch of Idiots were telling us was true. So we have a point of confusion, and you were there after the initial first day raid. Correct. And I guess uh, my point is, is that this still photo does not confirm for us where those shots came. And I appreciate your not assumption sure. and your no. analysis having been inside, and I do believe that the point of us being here is to try and resolve it. But I wanted to make sure that this photo does not evidence the final word oh, no. on who shot first. No. Uh, and I wish you were here yesterday, and I'll, I'll just leave this for now. Let me move quickly. And but if Mr. Taylor can get that right door, it'll solve all, all the problems. We're all working on the door. Uh, and uh, his uh, witnesses. I hope we can get the EMT uh, dispatcher and the cameraman. But let me uh, go on to say there were not convictions on conspiracy and murder, my understanding. That's correct. But there were convictions on gun violations and some of the, and some of the defendants. That's correct. Let me ask you with respect to, I hate using H.R. 666, let me just call it this uh, new legislation on the exclusionary rule. Um, what would be your position, and I think the American people need to understand the layman's language, that we no longer had the necessity of a viable paper search warrant that we could act on good faith. How would that have further impacted this very tragic situation? I, I, my, my main concern with anything that deals with the exclusionary rule is not what happens to do with a paper. A piece of paper is not what I'm after. What I want is to involve a neutral and impartial non-law enforcement officer. So if you didn't have judge. that anymore, if you yeah. didn't have that undercover agent, as I said on the municipal court bench, reviewing in other types of situation, some independent force bringing that uh, undercover agent who'd been in the field sweating, tense, to review it, losing that intervening action you think would be detrimental. Yes, absolutely. I, I can't believe a magistrate appro approved that search warrant, to be honest with but you. But certainly if we remove that by law, that would be a problem. It would be yes. terrible. It would, put, it would put the entire discretion over whether your Fourth Amendment rights are uh, observed in the hands of an officer who is often, as, the, as it goes, often engaged in the competitive enterprise of ferreting out crime. Uh, someone with his ox in the ditch, so to speak. Someone who wants that search warrant. And, and you've got to interpose a judge in that decision. And I point out if innocent people then would be impacted negatively. Yes. Absolutely. And if we're talking about searching, and my a time is almost home. running. If you do that, okay. so I can ask, finish your point. Let me, so I can be able to ask my last. I question. don't know what six 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 says, and I don't know if it's restricted to non-home situations. But a person's no, is home not. is his or her castle, and to allow a search without a neutral and impartial judge saying there's probable cause to search a person's home, I think lessens all of our civil. Let rights. me go on to say, and I thank you very much, and I'm not intending to cut you off. Let me say also in dispute is that there's a helicopter shooting. We have testimony that says they retreated, and of course there's some question you indicated. Uh, this is a question, Mr. Chairman, so I'd like to finish it and be able to have uh, these gentlemen answer it. You indicated that, um, uh, that um, it could have been, when I say you, I think it was Mr. DeGarren, that uh, shots could have been through the ceiling, but I'm trying to isolate the disputed issues. This question follows for both of you all to answer. You were inside and you made the points about the setting, the atmosphere. We are querying and trying to understand so that we can ask intelligent questions of the FBI how the Schroeders, the Wayne Martins of the world, the engineers, the teachers, or whoever went there were mesmerized and so seemingly lacking in power in decisions to come out and to save themselves, the children, and the women. If you would answer those question, that question for me, please. Let, let me address that, and, and I hope you ask that same question of the two religious experts that are coming next, because they can talk about it in terms that I cannot. But this was not a bunch of people who'd, had, uh, who'd been hypnotized. These people that I saw, and I met almost everybody in there that died in that fire, these people believed. They believed in the Bible. They were there because of the Bible. Most of them, well, I can't say that. Many of them were there not because of David Koresh. Some people had been there as long as 40 years. Some people had been born and raised there. They were there because they believed in a, uh, a vision of the Bible that was unusual. 
I don't understand it. I, and, uh, and, and these scholars have a difficult time understanding it. But it was real. You can't legislate away that. In fact, the First Amendment says that we can't do anything about that. They believed. Gentlelady's uh, time has expired. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, the chairman of the full Judiciary Committee, Mr. Henry Hyde. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask both of you if you agree with what I'm going to read to you uh, from an article by Dean Kelly of the National Council of Churches that appeared in the May 1995 magazine called First Things. Ironically, just as the federal government was abandoning hope for a peaceful solution, there opened up the possibility of just such an outcome. Early in the siege, Koresh had promised to come out if his message could be aired on national media. He prepared an hour-long audio tape that was broadcast locally, but not, he claimed, nationally. Two scholars of apocalyptic religion, Phil Arnold of the Reunion Institute in Houston and James Tabor of the University of North Carolina, studied the broadcast and believed Koresh could be reasoned with if approached within his own frame of reference. After several futile efforts to persuade the FBI to let them try, they arranged with Ron Engelman, host of a radio talk show on KGBS, to which the Davidians listened, for a half hour's uninterrupted plea to Koresh to rethink his understanding of the fifth seal, Revelation 6, 9, 11, which he believed to be unfolding at Mount Carmel. In the text, the souls of the faithful who have been slain for the word of God cry out to God, how long before thou wilt avenge our blood? They are given white robes and told to rest for a little season until the number of their fellow servants who have been killed, as they have been, should be complete. The sixth seal that follows brings about the destruction of humankind. Arnold and Tabor in their radio colloquy sought to persuade Koresh that the term translated a little season meant in the original Greek a period of as much as a year, leaving time for Koresh to complete his work before the sixth seal supervened. Koresh apparently accepted this idea for on the day after Passover, he sent out a letter via his lawyer saying that God had permitted him to explain in structured form the decoded messages of the seven seals, and that upon completion of that task, he would surrender. The FBI saw this as just another in a long series of delaying tactics and went ahead with their plans to use tear gas. They did send in writing materials, however, on Sunday, April 18th, and Koresh worked most of that night, dictating to Ruth Riddle, who typed his words on a battery-powered word processor. He completed a five-page introduction to the seven seals, a poem of 13 quatrains, and a seven-page exposition of the first seal. At that rate, Arnold and Tabor estimated he should have completed the task in two or three weeks, but he did not get the chance. The next morning, the FBI gas assault began, and David Koresh must have concluded that his original scenario of imminent destruction was correct. Do you agree with that? that I do. I, just read? Um, I, I can speak to that um, if you'd like. And what we found, <clears throat> the FBI uh, ridiculed the idea that he would be writing the seven seals and said, he, uh, in fact, after the fire, said they had evidence that he was not at work on that. We discovered uh, by talking to Ruth Riddle that she had taken this computer disk out with her when she escaped the fire. And we found that he, he had been working on it, and it, uh, it was a real thing. And we also found that those on the inside, these believers, thought that this was a great uh, revelation to them in that their death, the end of the world, as prophesied by the Bible, was not coming immediately, but was some distant time in the future. That's what I was trying to with the help of Tabor and Arnold, talked to Koresh and the others about that their interpretation that the apocalypse was now was that, no, it's a little bit later. And that's the history of Seventh-day Adventism. 
There have been prophets time after time who have prophesied the end of the world at a certain date. And everybody gathers and they wait for the end of the world. It doesn't come. They dishonor that prophet and go on. And that's the history of those people. The unfortunate thing is in the context of Jonestown and the James Jones experience, there is such a cynical uh, approach towards religious fanaticism. There is an unwillingness to understand or believe that there are people in the world who are persons of belief and they believe strange things by our standard. But had, had some understanding had the understanding been these weren't hostages. These were willing members of a religious group and to get, to get in there and to dissipate them would take persuasion, argumentation from, in their frame of reference, not tear gas and not tanks. And that, it seems to me, was, was the judgment made somewhere along the line that ended up costing a lot of lives. Yes, I agree. I agree. And, and if you in your next few days will find out who made those ridiculously dangerous decisions, then I think that would be exercising your oversight responsibilities, and you're the only one in the country can do it. Well, I thank you for saying that, and I think that shows the utility of these hearings. We may not come up with any legislation. There doesn't always have to be legislation, but we ought to come up with information that will help guide us in the future because I'm sure Jonestown and Waco are not the end of this sort of situation. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair now wishes to recognize Mr. Brewster from Oklahoma for five minutes. Certainly. Sorry. Uh, beeper going off. All kinds of problems here. Boat going on. Uh, you gentlemen probably had more contact with Koresh than anyone that, that I know of. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what would have happened had he been arrested when he went to town on the weapons charges or whatever. Was there anyone else in that compound, in your opinion, that could have pulled everybody together in a violent manner? No, sir. My client was Steve Schneider. My partner, Jim Levine, was uh, Judy Schneider's lawyer. The two Schneiders were married and had a two-year-old child. Steve was labeled by the FBI as the, quote, first lieutenant, along with the other military terms that were applied, like the compound, which I've noticed from these hearings y'all have all accepted. It was Mount Carmel Center for 35 years, and then when the FBI came in, it became Mount Carmel Com Com Compound, first lieutenant, cultist, etc. Steve was an articulate, decent, peaceful uh, guy who'd, who was a college graduate and had his degree in, in theology. Uh, if, if the FBI considered him the second in command, I can tell you without any reservation that Steve Schneider would not have organized any kind of violent resistance uh, to a search warrant. In fact, when I had my, comment, my first meeting with him, I, I thought he was going to break into tears when we were... Dick was asking the, the standard lawyer question about we've got to find out where the five Davidians that were killed are. You know, where are their remains? We need to make sure they're preserved for autopsy so we can see the angles and so forth some pretty tough stuff. And then Steve started talking about their loss of life, and he volunteered to me how sad they felt at the loss of the ATF agent's lives. So in my judgment, there would not have been a, a, a violent resistance. It, it, uh, frankly, I don't think there would have been a violent resistance if the search warrant had been served in a proper manner, even if Koresh was there. But to answer your question, if one of the many times he was away, if he had been arrested, put in federal custody for three days, which they can keep him for three days with no reason at all, execute a search warrant the next day. I think this all could have been uh, uh, resolved and avoided. You would agree with that, Mr. Gutzbegger? I, I do agree with that. Uh, and, and I think that it could have been uh, done in a, a number of other different ways. And history shows they had a good relationship with the local sheriff. Uh, he'd, he'd surrendered peacefully before. Uh, on much more serious charges. I understand that the charges uh, that the ATF were bringing were relatively minor federal felonies. Now, <laughs> well, you know, going to prison, that's not real minor, but in, in the scheme of things, it, the maximum punishment for these crimes would have been about 10 years in, in the penitentiary. Under the federal guidelines, probably the time in the penitentiary would have been two or three years. So they're not really 
that serious. And he had he'd surrendered peacefully uh, on charges that could have landed him in jail for life. Uh, he had invited the ATF. They, he told us that story about McMahon that McMahon told here. He told me that inside, and I, and I found out that to be true. I, I telephoned McMahon, talk, talked to the girlfriend. He had invited the ATF to come in and look at the guns back in July of 1992. Uh, I think one Texas Ranger could have walked up to the front door and knocked on it and be let, let in. That's my opinion. That's my next question. Is uh, I've heard all kinds of stories that the Rangers wanted to be involved in the negotiations, that Koresh had uh, uh, wanted to negotiate with them. Is there any validity to that, or is that only rumor? It's, it's not exactly that way. It's not rumor. What I wanted to do and, and what I proposed to David Koresh after talking to Captain Maurice Cook was that, David, the world's watching. Let's have one Texas Ranger walk up to the front door, and you and I will walk out and surrender to him. That'll be sending a message to the people of the world that you don't trust the ATF and the FBI, the feds that got you in this in the first place, but you do trust our legal system and the Texas Rangers. And being from Texas, uh, there's that story about one riot, one ranger, and I thought that that would be a real good thing to do. He agreed with it. He thought it was a good idea, and he agreed to do it that way, but not immediately. I went back, uh, assured, got assurances from uh, Captain Cook that that was uh, okay with him, but he said, you've got to go through the FBI. It's just protocol, and they're running the show, and you've got, uh, we're not going to suggest it to him. You do it. I did suggest it. I, I can't say it was rejected, but it wasn't greeted with a lot of enthusiasm. No. Okay. If... Uh if they, if after his letter April 14th, what would you have expected the time frame to have occurred had the raid on April 19th not occurred? It, it would have been at least a week, uh, maybe a little bit longer. Did this uh, compound have uh, toilet facilities in it? Or I noticed they, in referring to the Treasury Department uh, deal here, they sent a guy to an outhouse at one point. Uh, did they even have toilet facilities in there? Uh, they did, but very few. They were building this place. This was new construction, although it was used lumber, and they were doing it themselves, and they're very proud of it. They didn't have a lack of uh, toilet facilities out of design, just they hadn't built them yet. They were in the process of building it. I went into almost every room in that compound, and I saw the building that was going on. They were doing it themselves. There were shower stalls. There were toilets. There were... But they just weren't operating yet. They were in the process of construction. Future plans that they had, inconsistent with the world's going to end now. And there were other things that showed future plans. Uh, uh, for instance, I was to file a lawsuit to perfect title to the property. They were worried about that. I, I uh, prepared an inter vivos trust so that any money that came to them or to David as a result of book rights or anything like that over and above legal expenses would not go to him but would go to a trust for all of his children and I met 14 of his children and and there were other things that were inconsistent with a suicide plan gentlemen's time has expired Aaron. chair would like to announce that uh, there will be at least two votes uh, which will take us about a half an hour uh, we think that it's in the best interest of everybody if we recess and convene at 12:45 uh, p.m., it's going to be a long day, and uh, I think we'll just uh, recess until 12:45. We'll return for more of day five of the Waco investigation hearings, but first, some programming notes. Wednesday on C-SPAN, South Korean President Kim Young-Sam addresses a joint meeting of Congress. He'll discuss the importance of South Korea's relationship with the United States.